The scripture reading this morning comes from the second book of Samuel in the 23rd chapter at the 11th verse. King David is the central character in this book of the Hebrew scriptures. It is the story of David's 40 year reign as king over Israel. This passage speaks of one of the three chiefs of David's mighty warriors. And here begins the reading. Next to him was Shammah, son of A.G. the Hererite. When the Philistines banded together at a place where there was a field full of lentils, Israel's troops fled from them. But Shammah took his stand in the middle of the field. He defended it and struck the Philistines down, and the Lord brought about a great victory. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Thy word, O God, is a lamp to our feet, a light to our path. It is life itself. And when everything <clears throat> fades away and everything is crumbling and the earth teeters and totters, thy word remains. We pray for an intersection this morning taking place in our heart between the written word and the living word, Jesus Christ. And so send your Holy Spirit, we beg. Fill me with the gift of preaching and fill your congregation with the holiness of the Spirit to be the place in which you rest your word, that it would reign in us and dwell in us richly. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you were with us last week, you understand that we began a five-week focus, a sermon series on First Christian Church. I don't really like to call it a series on First Christian Church because that makes it sound like it's all about us. And it's really about what God has elected to do with First Christian. Last week, we discussed our founding and seven things that we see in our history that we call them stakes in the ground where we saw God lead us into bold moves out of obedience to him. And if you've ever discerned, if you're looking at your own life, maybe you were reflecting on the, the big things in your life, where you've lived, who you've married, what you've done for a living, you look at maybe the top seven things in your life. You'll find three things in common. The first is, whatever those milestones were, it wasn't your idea. When God leads a person, a believer, into a mighty act, a mighty moment of faith, he's the one that puts a strange idea in your heart. He's the one that slips in that thought that didn't begin with you, and you start to let it ruminate. You think, that's, that's stranger than fiction. So number one, when God, for instance, had us relocate from Avenue J and 13th to here, when God had us invest in missionaries, give to Juliet Fowler, when God had us do certain things, number one, it wasn't our idea. Number two is that when God calls us to do something, it requires faith. It requires putting chips on the table. This world is full of Monday morning quarterbacks, as you can tell by my voice. We're full, we've got tons of opinions. I've joked before that I'm an expert when it comes to my opinion. This word's full of judgment. But an act of God in a person's life isn't just an idea or a concept. It's you taking bold steps, saying yes to God with things at stake, where you're willing to up and move your family, when you're willing to donate money, when you're willing to believe in something enough to put weight on it. It's not your idea. It requires faith. Number three is it's not for our glory. The biggest things that happen in our life, the biggest things that happen in the life of a church are not about us. 
You could, you could uh, punch us out of the scenario and move us away, and it's still as beautiful. The big moves in this church, there are more than seven things we've done, obviously, but the big moves in the life of this church were summed up in that. They weren't our ideas. They took a lot of faith, a lot of sacrifice. Number three is it was done for the glory of God, not for the glory of man. We mentioned last week that it's critical that we understand what God was doing so that we can arrange our shoulders in line with the past We can face the proper direction, but we face forward, not backward, so that we can take the next step. We can put the next stake in the ground. We can take that next step of faith for the glory of God through First Christian. And this morning's text and and our focus is about the truth of our past and also what's going to be necessary for our future is that our church has been filled with men like Shama in today's scripture. It's one of my favorite stories in the whole Bible. It's rarely preached, it's very often read. If I referenced it without reading it, most people wouldn't have a clue what I'm talking about. But here's the story. David had several mighty men throughout his tenure, throughout his leadership, and one of them was named Shama. During invading forces, the Philistines, Amorites, when an invasion would happen, David was the head of the army and he would send out his mighty men in different spots. And imagine you're one of these mighty men, women, we love you all. And you're receiving your order where you're going to put your life at stake, where you're willing to lay down your life for the sake of the kingdom. And You might get to, uh, for instance, guard the palace or the water source. You might guard the temple of God. You might get to guard the school where all the children are. You might get to guard places of honor. Shema received his report. He was going to guard a patch of lentils. He was going to be willing to die to save a patch of lentils. So I want you to focus for a minute on how we as people, as a church, have a hallway for preachers with their pictures on the wall. But the true story, all, all those pictures represent is an era of the church. We can look at a face. I remember when Dudley was here. I remember when Michael was here. I remember when Sutherland was here. I remember when Carpenter was here. And that person represents an era, but we all know that the church is filled way more with people who are willing to lay down their effort, lay down their focus for a patch of lentils. It's the person willing to go pick up somebody who can't get to church and bring him here. Not once, but every week for 10 years. It's the person who comes to church early on Sunday morning to pass out bulletins even though it's difficult. It's the person who donates and as to not be talked about from the pulpit, so I promise I won't do that, they donate to be helpers and sowers in ministries like St. Benedict's, Casa. Now some of you know these people. One of the greatest lentil garters with all of his might in our church is named Ismo Hinahosa, who is the lead over our property crew who treats this property and his care of it as if he is preaching a sermon, as if he is fighting a battle, as if he is leading a board meeting. This church has been filled with shamas, folks that looked at their report and said, to the lintel patch, we, we live or we die, but to the lintel patch. As we see in this story, 
Shammah went and took his stand, and the Philistines came over the hill. If you don't know much about the Philistines, Goliath was a true person. He was a giant that was killed, but Goliath also represented a truth that there is a moment in the historical spectrum where some people were living in the Bronze Age and some people were living in the Iron Age. The Hebrews were living in the Bronze Age. The people they were fighting were living in the Iron Age. They were ahead. They were ahead militarily. They had better might. The Philistines had better uh, warriors. They had better guns or whatever they had back then. They didn't really have guns, but they had better equipment. They had better armor. They were a force to be reckoned with. There was no way that you could defeat the Philistines bullet for bullet. Theirs were better. And so it wasn't just an army coming. It was there was a Philistine army coming over the hill, and Shammah heard the report that he, with lesser means, but with great faith, was going to run out and stand firm in the patch of lentils, knowing very well that this could be his final act. But he felt fine because he had his brothers with him. Well, as the Philistines came over the hilltop, according to the story, they saw the Philistines and every one of them but Shama ran away. Israel's troops, when they saw the Philistines, were frightened and fled. But Shama took his stand in the middle of the field. Now can you imagine what it was like to be one of these Israelite warriors who said, "Why well, I, mean, I, I love the King David, I love Yahweh, but I'm not about to face a certain death against those guys for these lentils. I'm going to get inside the city wall. And so they ran. And don't say you're not tempted to. They ran. And as soon as they reached the wall, they heard a weird noise. It was the noise of pain. It was the noise of death. Several men. Oh, ah! And then there was one noise of victory. The voice of their friend, their brother, Shama. The Scriptures teach because Shama stood his ground and defeated countless Philistines in that moment. He was willing to face every one that came over the hill that emboldened all the men who had run away and they ran back. Not only do churches have ismos, shamas, not only are they present doing their job, doing what some of us would consider a task that that's not, I don't want to do that. I'd rather, I'd rather have the microphone. I'd rather sing in the choir. I'd rather be seen. I don't want to be hidden. Not only do churches have these mighty men and mighty women of God, but when you are near them and you see the way that they care for the ministry that's been placed in their hands, it emboldens you to do yours. This morning... This is a short message. But we are to sit and meditate with the reality of all the silent saints since 1901 to 2017 who stood in their lentil patch, who received little to no recognition, nor did they want it. But it wasn't that they just stood in their lentil patch. It's that they did it for the Lord. They did the things that nobody signs up for. And they did it for God. And the next 50 years are going to require the same thing. For the people of God to rise up. And when God puts something on your heart, on my heart, 
home visitation, missions, to step foot on Texas Tech, not to just go to a football game, but go on Monday morning to go meet with students and share the gospel. To get here early to make 30 to 40 pots of coffee. To go and take our sanctuary flowers every week that have been blessed and dedicated and rearrange them and go deliver them, hand deliver them to our shut-ins, our homebound members. To extend yourself. It's great to understand the path that we're on, the seven mighty things that God has done through our church. But what needs to be remembered as well are the untold stories of the people who've lived and died and given themselves to the ministry through this church. And they will never have their picture on the wall. But when it comes to God's kingdom, they're rock stars. This morning, the word of God is for none of us to be below the lintel, or above the lintel patch. For all of us to be willing to take our stand for God and something that he's called us to do. And you understand that God is moving in you to call you to do certain things beyond yourself. To do that with great fervor. And not only that it's good for you, it's good for God's kingdom, but there are going to be people around you that are emboldened because they see the way you give your life your all. The next 50 years are going to be tied deeply not only to how great the preacher is, but to what takes place without the sight, what takes place the iceberg under the water, what takes place behind closed doors, what takes place in our prayer closet, what takes place and the secret thoughts. God the Father calls all people unto himself that we would die unto ourselves and live for him. And that he would use us in every aspect. May this be a day where the most honored among us are the people who never get recognition. As we enter in this sermon, I'm going to enter us into a time of prayer, and I want you to be thinking of the people in your life that you know of. I can't even start naming them or I'd leave out so many people. And take this moment this morning to reach out, to write that card, to make that phone call, to touch somebody and say, you know, I I see you in your lentil patch, and it gives me strength. And at the same time, to ask God to continue to send out laborers into the vineyard, that we would stand firm for him and with him. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, by the power of Christ's Spirit, we pray that you would stir up in our church a living gratitude, a a humble joy to go and shake the hands of those who daily stand for you. Mighty women, mighty men of God, who aren't here to serve themselves. They're not here to serve man. They're here to serve the living God. We pray, Father, that you would shake and show the ministry of the saints of God who do the things that get no credit but to trust that in the kingdom of God and in the book of life, they get more than enough credit. And that when the angels watch and our Lord Jesus observes on the earth and sees someone doing a simple task with great faith, may we see also with the eyes of faith that that moment, that widow giving her might is a full expression of trust and faith in you that your kingdom will claim and use. Bless those, Father, who serve. Bless the shamas of the world who stand in the lintel patch and do what needs to be done. We thank you, Father. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Would you please rise as we sing our closing hymn?